stand up real quick, look at the person next to you and say, don't forget your swimming trunks. You can be seen. We're going to uh, start out real silly and then we're going to get real serious. Imagine a day at the beach, okay? I love the beach. If you go to the beach, though, the first thing you need is your hat to keep the sun off your head, okay? Second thing you need is some suntan lotion so you don't get burned up. Then you need, you like it, some sporty sunglasses, what do you think? Okay? And then you'll need a towel, of course, to lay on or to wipe yourself off with. But again, the most important that you can't forget is your swimming trunks, okay? Because if you show up to the beach without your swimming trunks or your bathing suit, you'll probably get arrested. All right? So very, very important. Now that was the silly. Now I want to talk about the serious. As Christians, it is so important not to forget that God is in control. Amen? Amen. That God is in control. Psalm 122, 1 and 2 says, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. The maker of heaven and earth. He deserves to be in control of our lives. Amen. So don't forget God is in control and God should be in control. Now, if you're a Christian this morning, and I hope you are, but if you're a Christian this morning, but you're living areas of your life that God is not in control or you're not allowing God to be in control, it's kind of like this. I'm going to use some more glasses, full of glasses today. It's kind of like going to a 3D movie, all right? These are my X-Men 3D glasses. And you go to a 3D movie and they give you glasses to put on. But you go to the movie and you decide not to wear your glasses. Well, you can still watch the movie. And you can still see the movie. But the movie is not near as good, it's not near as clear, and it's not near as powerful if you would have put your glasses on. Now, listen, this morning, can you walk with God? Yes. Can you come to church every Sunday? Yes. But listen, your walk is going to be much more powerful and real as real can be if you leave here today knowing that you know that God is in control. Amen? Amen. And that God should be in control control. A great passage of scripture that we're going to study this morning about God being in control is Exodus the 14th chapter starting in verse 1. And through this whole text this morning I want you to continue to ask yourself the question is God in control? Is God in control of my life? Exodus 14 verse 1 Then the Lord said to Moses then the Lord said to Moses, don't you love the name Moses? I'm going to be honest with you. I love it so much that if I would have had a son, no kidding, I would have wanted to name him Moses. Don't you like that? Moses Stowe. Wouldn't that sounded good over the loudspeaker and rising sun at a basketball game? Now starting at guard number 24, Moses Stowe. I like that name. But I didn't have a boy and it probably wouldn't have looked good naming my girls Moses. Alright. But I love the name Moses. Moses was a powerful man because he was powerfully used by God. He was used by God to be God's spokesman to the Egyptians who were keeping the Israelites in slavery. Again, God used Moses as a powerful spokesman. That word, spokesman. You know we're all spokesmen. For God. Amen? Amen? And the Word of God says that our lives, our lives speak. Our lives should shout, the Bible says, holiness. Our lives should shout, pure in heart. Our lives should shout, reverent fear for God. Our lives should shout, faithfulness. Our lives should shout, obedience. The Bible says, to obey God is to love God. So I ask you this morning, what is your... Life really shouting. Because remember, you are a spokesman for God. Mark Batterson 
writes this. Church is not a spectator sport. In fact, you cannot just go to church because you are the church. Church should be happening everywhere you go. The way we live our lives is a sermon. It's a testimony to the life-changing power of God. Sam Stowe writes, When we leave this place, we don't leave the presence of God. We take the presence of God with us everywhere we go. We don't want to be a flash in a pan. We want to be light to the world. We want to be light to the world. We are spokesmen for God. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piahartha between Megal. Tell the Israelites. The Lord was talking to Moses. He was telling him something that he needed to tell the Israelites. Oswald Chambers writes, You must align your heart and mind with God's sovereign instructions and guidelines. You must do what He says. Psalms 32, 8 writes, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. God is in control. But I want to tell you something that we all can become very good at if we're not careful. I learned this art through my sisters. I grew up with three sisters, Susie, Patty, and Carol. And I tell you what, they all perfected this, telling me what to do. All right? They were very good at it. I mean, them girls, yap, 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 yap. And I'm going to tell you what, they're still good at it. Yap, 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 yap. So I tell you what I learned. The art of tuning them out. I can look them right in the eyes and just act like I'm going to listen in, you know, and on every word, and I'm going to tell you the truth, it's going in here and going right out here. I'm thinking about everything else. I have tuned them out. And let's be honest, if we're not careful, we can do that with God. We can come to church, we can open up our Bible, and we can take notes, but yet we're tuning them out. Something said we really don't like, or we don't want to change, or we, just, we let it go in here and out here. Listen, let God be in control. Amen. Don't tune God out. We mustn't tune God out as individuals, and we mustn't tune God out as a church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piharoth between the Gull and the sea. And they are to encamp by the river directly opposite of Belsiphon. Pharaoh will think, Pharaoh will think that the Israelites are running around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Who's in control? God is in control. And He will pursue them. But I will gain glory. I, who's in control? God is in control. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his armies. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Who's in control? God's in control. Who must be in control? God must be in control. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled... Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them and said, What have we done? See, at first, they were cool with the Israelites leaving. But then all of a sudden, the Egyptians got thinking, Wait a minute. With the Israelites gone, who's going to do all the cooking? Who's going to do all the cleaning? Who's going to do all the repair work? We better go after them. We have left the Israelites and lost their services. So he had his chariots made ready and took with his, his army. Had his chariots made ready. When you're talking about chariots back in those days, you're talking like today, the United States' best tanks, okay? The best weapons for war. The chariots would be like tanks. So they pursued the Israelites with the best chariots along with the other chariots of Egypt. So all the chariots 
were after him. All the tanks were after him, if you would, with the officers over all of them. Officers. Men who knew how to win wars. This was not rookies. This was officers. No privates. Officers over them all. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Who is in control? God is in control. So that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and troops pursued, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pahiroth, opposite Belsophon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Could you imagine that? Here you are. You're the Israelite people. You think you're free. Everything is going fine. And you look up and there is the Egyptian army. The, the best of the best surrounding you. Of course you would be terrified. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. A terrifying story for Sam Stowe. It's not about the Egyptian army. It's not about tanks. Maybe silly to you, but it wasn't silly to me. This terrifying story is about a snake. Okay? I hate snakes. How many people here hate snakes? Yes, praise the Lord. Okay. I was 10 years old and I was fishing. This local farm pond that wasn't that far of a walk from my grandma's house. And I'm fishing and I got a stringer of fish. And I'm fishing, and I actually got one on the line, and things are going great. It's a beautiful day. My blonde, blonde curly hair is blowing in the wind. Really had some then. Pulling one in, you know. And I look down, and crawling across the top of my tennis shoes is a snake. And I'd like to tell you that I was a big, tough guy and kicked that snake off. No worries. Roar! And kept on fishing. No, 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 no. This was my reaction. Ah! Throw my pole up in the air, took off running, never stopped, could run a little bit like back then until I hit the back door of Grace Cofield's house. And I came flying in there. And she said, what in the world's wrong with you? And all I could say was, snake, snake, snake. She said, sit down, tell me what happened. I was fishing. Things was going good. That snake, that nasty thing crawled right across my feet. And I had to get out of there. I was terrified. What'd you do with your pole? I threw it down. What'd you do with your tackle box? I left it there. What'd you do with the fish you caught? They're still there too. I had to get to you, Grandma. I seen a snake. It scared me to death. And she said, well, you got to go back and get your tackle box and get your pole and get your fish. And, you know, then I was calmed down. Then I manned up. Then I said, that'll be fine. I'll go get it. But you're going with me. <laughs> and she did. Okay? So, you can imagine the Egyptian army all around you. It was even worse than a snake experience. And I know some of you men out there, you're just as scared as a snake as I am. Shame on you. But anyway. So the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Piharoth and opposite Melsophon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them, and they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. That was good. They did the right thing. They cried out to the Lord. But you know what? When we cry out to the Lord, the Lord talks back to us, doesn't He? He does. They cried out to the Lord. They did. Good for them. But you know what? They didn't listen to what He said back. Now Sam, how do you know that they didn't listen to what He said back? Well, by the way, they treated their leader Moses. By the way, they treated their leader Moses, who had been appointed by God. Look at this. They said to Moses, verse 11, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to the desert to die? See, they was whining and they complained. And can't you see the hand on the hip? And look what you did to us now, Moses. Way to go now, Moses. You sure really know what you was doing, Moses. Yeah. Yeah, getting on Moses. 
Yeah. You brought us out here to the desert to die. What have you done bringing us up out of Egypt? Didn't we so to you, say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Way to go, Moses. You really got it going on. But we see how Moses handles their whining and their criticism and their fit. This is what Moses does. He just throws that finger right back at them. He just starts shaking that hip and just they get in a shouting match. No, Moses didn't do that. Moses threw his hands up in the air and said, I quit. I'm done. He starts walking away in the desert and says, I didn't really like you people anyway. No, Moses doesn't do that. This is what Moses does. He starts bouncing and bobbing and weaving. Because, you know, he was a shepherd and he had to protect the sheep so Moses could fight a little bit. So he just started beating the time out of him. No, Moses didn't do that. No, that's not the way godly leaders handle things. Moses answered the people, verse 13, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Verse 13, Do not be afraid. Do you know in the Bible there are 365 fear knots? 365 fear knots. One for every day. Hebrews 13.6 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? One of my favorites, Psalm 34.4. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. I can remember being on vacation in Florida with my girls. And they wanted to go parasailing. And we were out there on the boat. And the guy was getting ready to hook us all up to go parasailing. I looked at Shelby and Butter. And I said, girls, are you scared? And they looked up at me like I was nuts. I said, girls, are you scared? And they looked up at me and they said, well, no, daddy. You're here. You're here. I didn't have the heart to say, well, girls, I'm scared to death. I hope you don't sink the boat. No. But you're here. Hey, is life tough? Yeah, but you're here. Is life hard? Yeah, but you're here. Are people going to do us wrong? Yeah, but you're here. Is our heart going to get broke? Yeah, but you're here. You're here. Fear not. Fear not. God is in control. And Moses says, stand firm. Stand firm. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 16.8 says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Stand firm. Listen. Churches. All churches. That go through tough times. That go through hard times. Weber Street's been through tough times, hard times. It's happened, but aren't you glad you stayed? Amen. Aren't you glad you stood firm? Amen. Stand firm, the Lord says. And when you fear not, do not be afraid. And when you stand firm, you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. Now this is where we get to the really, really serious part. There may be some of you today that need deliverance. And I mean deliverance from blatant sin. Blatant sin. The Holy Spirit has told you that it's wrong, but you continue to walk in it. You've been to church, you've been to Sunday school, you've been convicted from the Word of God, but you blatantly continue to walk in it. See, the devil's got you thinking that it's no bigger than getting your hand caught in the cookie jar. Remember those days when you're told not to get a cookie out of the cookie jar and you, you get caught in the cookie jar? And what happens to most of us when our hand got caught in the cookie jar? Don't do that again. Stop doing that as soon as the adult left the room what we were doing we were getting back in the cookie jar because it really wasn't that big a deal to us it was no more than a slap of the hand a slap of the wrist listen to me blatant sin continuing to walk in blatant sin is a very 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 big deal 
It's serious. Look with me in Galatians. Chapter 5. Start with verse 19. Galatians 5, 19. Mark this. It's much more than a slap on the wrist. It's much more than getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Remember the old saying, as obvious as the nose on your face. They're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will get a slap on the wrist. It is the same as getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar. It doesn't say that. Those who continue to live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's serious. That's a big deal. Can you be forgiven for any of that, of all of that? You absolutely can. But to not ask for forgiveness, to not want to be forgiveness, forgiven, to not want to repent, but continue to, to walk in that like it's no big deal. Listen to me. On the authority of the Word of God and who is in control, God. it's a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> it's much more than getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Back to our text. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Wow. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Verse 14, another good one to mark. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Let's imagine that you were in a cooking contest. And you had to win this cooking contest because if you didn't win that cooking contest, lights out. The morning of the cooking contest, you hear knock, 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 knock on the back door. And you go to the back door and guess to your surprise who it is? It's Chef Boardee. <laughs> and Chef Boardee says, listen, you don't have to worry about this cooking contest. I got this handled. Just be still. <laughs> Or let's say you're in a wrestling match and you've got to wrestle a great big gorilla of a man and if you don't win, lights out. And on the morning of the wrestling match, you get a knock, 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 knock on the door and it's Luther Reigns, my buddy. And he says, hey, you don't have to worry about this wrestling match today. I got this for you. Just be still. Listen, God is saying if you let me, I mean if you really, really let me, I mean, really let me, really let me be in control. I'll fight for you. I'll fight for you. How many of us in here this morning have ever experienced God fighting for him? Yeah. Just be still. Just be still. You know what that means? Let me lead, God is saying. Let me be in control. I know you wanted it this way, but believe me, God saying, I know best. I know you may have wanted it over here, but God's, listen, God should be in control. Let Him fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, while you are crying out to me, tell the Israelites to move on. Yes, you've prayed. Yes, you've cried out to me. Yes, you've prayed. Yes, you've cried out to me. But now it's time for some action. Now it's time to move on. Tell the Israelites to move on. And you know what move on means right here? It means move on. But move on into the sea. Remember, they're hemmed in. Desert and the, and the sea. And the Lord says, move on. Lead them into the sea. Yes, that endless sea where you can't see dry land, lead them into the sea. I don't mean walk up and put your big toe in the sea and get out. I don't mean walk up and hop in the sea and get out. I mean walk in the sea and keep moving on. 
Because God is in control. Amen? Amen? And if God has something for you to do, will He equip you? Will He strengthen you? Will He protect you? Ephesians 3.20 God is able. God is able. Then the Lord said to Moses, while you're crying out to me, tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. I, God was, because God is in control. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Real quick, let's look at verse 26 and 28. Same chapter, verse 14, <coughs> verses 26 and 28. You know what? I'm going to have to use my beach towel today. <laughs> Working up a sweat up here. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may fly back, flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh and that had followed the Israelites into the sea and none of them survived. Wow. Is there any battle that we're going to face while we're here on this old earth that our God is not big enough to handle? God should be in control. I've been reading this little daily walk from Proverbs. And the devotion the other day was really good. Think about this as I read it. Have you made God the cornerstone of your life? Have you made God the cornerstone of your life? Or is He regulated, regulated to a few hours on Sunday morning? Have you genuinely allowed God to reign over every corner of your heart? Or you have attempted to place Him in a spiritual compartment? The answer to these questions will determine the direction of your day and your life. God loves you in times of trouble. He will comfort you in times of sorrow. He will dry your tears when you are weak or sorrowful. God is as near as your next breath. He stands at the door of your heart and waits. Welcome Him in and allow Him to rule. And then accept the peace and the strength and the protection and the abundance that only God can give. Is God in control? And I want to end this morning with that simple question. Is God in control? How do you know if God's in control? Hebrews 12, 2 says, fix your eyes upon Jesus. And who is Jesus? God in the flesh. Is God in control? Listen, if you're here this morning, and Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your, uh, your Savior, then I invite you to, to come and make that happen. But you know what? If you are here this morning, and you're a Christian, but there are blatant areas of sin in your life, and God is speaking to you about them this morning. And He is speaking to you about them very, very clearly. Then let Him deliver you. And if it can happen while you're standing here this morning, that's great. But listen to me. Yes, everybody knows you here. But listen to me. If God says you need to come up here, if God says you need to come up here and hit your knees and talk to Him, or you need to come up here and have me pray for you and with you, then you need to come. But don't Leave here until you're delivered. Because God needs to be in control. Will you stand? <coughs> Father God, I just thank you for allowing us to
to be here this morning. And Father God, I just want to thank you that we don't have to handle it. That you'll handle it for us. That you'll show us how to live in the right <coughs> way to live. If we'll just let you. So I pray this morning that we, we, I'm talking to me too, all of us, will really and truly let you have control of our individual lives and control of this church. Because God, we do not want to be a flash in the pan. We want to be light to the world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.